Uh, we're going to start off with Dustin Goring from uh, NOAA. I'll let him introduce his slides and entertain us for the next 20 minutes. Okay. All I'm this sure it'll be entertaining. <laughs> it might be more entertaining for you than me. All right. Um, well, thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to start off with the first of um, three presentations on the runoff risk topic. I'll kind of um, go through the um, where is the clicker? Um, the the history and background, and then uh, Heather and that's okay. That's fine. Heather and uh, Erica will talk about their state tools. All right. Well, we'll start off with just kind of the overall picture that we're all probably aware of. There's <clears throat> pretty widespread economic and environmental issues with excess nutrients, and what we're trying to do is produce another tool that can be in the toolbox to help kind of meet these state reduction goals for nutrients. So what are these runoff risk tools? These are decision support tools based on National Weather Service modeling um, with the intent to give uh, farmers and producers some information to help them with their short-term uh, field management decisions and nutrient application decisions. Really our goal is to kind of give them a heads up in the next week or so when conditions could be um, present for nutrients to, to um, be transported off their fields. <coughs> And if they were to use a tool, we would hopefully, they would divert, delay or divert those applications. And what we're really trying to do is we don't want to lose more nutrients, especially freshly applied nutrients, right off the landscape. So this is what the tool is trying to um, help point out to the producers. These tools are very successfully, um, successful examples of partnerships with federal and state agencies. The states actually own the tools. The Weather Service does the modeling. And the states are um, in charge of maintaining the websites and uh, conducting the outreach and um, training for these tools. And I guess the long-term impact would be if we could show some kind of um, apparent economic and also environmental imp uh, benefit, then maybe we would initiate some kind of voluntary behavioral change to at least um, put more consideration on the timing of applications going forward. So the next few slides will be kind of my um, my way to build a case for the application timing importance. And so um, we'll start off with the kind of framework that many people are aware of, of the, uh, the four R's. And we're going to try to weasel our way into the, the right time kind of component. Um, generally, right time is kind of plant-centric. Put the nutrients on when the plant needs it. Or it's very generic static information. Um, don't apply if it's frozen ground, or don't apply if an inch of rain is forecasted. But it doesn't have anything to do with the dynamic field-to-field -field kind of conditions that farmers are um, are dealing with, and there's no actionable guidance available out there until this point. Um, so that's what this tool is kind of helping to do. Um, a lot of our partners are in, in the business of collecting edge of field data, so we've kind of asked them to kind of look into that and extract some kind of information or main points that would be applicable to application timing. And some of the things they came back with were um, there's some parts of the year, these critical loss periods are much more important for when decisions are made for nutrient applications. Um, anytime field activity is uh, um, also an important factor with water quality as far as when runoff is going to occur. And the third one is that uh, the largest events really drive a big portion, a, 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 lot, a significant portion of nutrient losses on an annual basis. So if we really want to identify those largest events for sure to, um, to the users of the tool. So I'll just um, go through, some, a lot of this data is from Discovery Farms data from Wisconsin and Minnesota. So this is just the uh, phosphorus yield on a monthly basis across Wisconsin. We kind of see these critical loss periods. We have your late winter, early spring, and then at late spring, early, win uh, early summer, when the, the, field, the fields are unprotected, the soils aren't protected, and we have opportunities for soil loss. And this also happens to be when we have a lot of field activity going on. So this, these times are already crunched, are already busy. So this tool, if we can help it on a day-to-day -day basis, identify times we definitely don't want to apply right before um, is what this tool is helping to hopefully trying to do. Up in the north, uh, another factor we have definitely is winter. Half of our runoff can come off of snow or um, snow, melt, snow conditions or frozen ground, and with that, a lot of the nutrients as well. Um, now, a lot of the conservation practices that could be in place might not be as effective or uh, active during the winter time, so that um, would tell you that timing is probably the major factor, especially for newer applications in the winter, um, as far as your losses. Here's an example of um, where field management decisions is really the key player. This is a sediment yield against the total phosphorus. 
and it, with for non-frozen ground events. And you would see you'd have that relationship as you lose soil, you're going to lose some of that particulate phosphorus. But you see a group over here that's clustered to the left, it doesn't follow that, that relationship. And these are events that are where a nutrient application is shortly before runoff events. So these are what the runoff risk tool is trying to help avoid. Can we pick these events off and have, have them not occur? The rest of the other four R's are going to try to help the rest of the curve. Um, dealing with the largest events, so this is um, again edge of field data from Discovery Farms. They racked and stacked their 2,000 events, <clears throat> and when they did that, they found that the top 10% of the runoff events uh, contribute um, nearly half of the runoff and over 60% of the nutrient loads. So again, if we can definitely identify these larger events, don't pour, don't put more nutrients on right before them. Hopefully, we can make a little difference. Down in Ohio, they found something similar. Um, with their edge of field data sets, maybe winter isn't as big of a concern down there, so they rack their events by the, the rainfall magnitude, and they found that the top 10% of those, again, account for 65% of the, the runoff and the, uh, and the nutrient loads. So again, it's kind of pointing towards a big bang for your buck if we can definitely identify and delay um, some more nutrients being applied before these events. Okay, that was my background. So now we're going to what these heck these tools are. So um, this tool was born in Wisconsin back in the mid-2000s. There was a pretty bad winter where they had a lot of fish kills, well contaminations, and runoff events. And their state actually mandated their Department of Agriculture to come up with an online tool that their community, their users, farmers, producers could use to limit um, applying nutrients right before runoff would occur. Um, that kind of generated this version one tool you see here that was running until early this spring. And that was just a proof of concept tool based on our river forecast modeling. Um, so again, this tool is beyond just the rainfall forecast for tomorrow. This is, we're doing real time continuous soil moisture and runoff modeling. We're incorporating forecast temperatures and, and precipitation. Um, we pull out of the model different parts of the runoff components and we can carry it against its historical behavior. And then also against edge of field data sets where we can to kind of key in on the, um, the behavior in the model that cor corresponds with what we see in the, in the fields. The uh, version one tool got, kind of gained some momentum and some attention and in 2013. We kind of partnered with uh, GLRI to kind of expand it to uh, some other areas. So we went down to a version two. Um, to do that, we uh, moved to a four kilometer by four kilometer gridded um, model, which is now available in four states at the moment. Um, and that, of course, in, um, <clears throat> required an all new validation of the model and the algorithms that go behind it. And so when we did that, we did many iterations on um, identifying the model parameters and thresholds that we want to key in on. And we, um, we would always go back to the edge of field data set and see if can we mimic what the edge of field is showing us. Now, it is a little bit of apples and oranges comparison. We're talking grid, grid uh, cells versus just individual fields where we have data. So it's, it's hard to make a one-to-one -one comparison, but um, generally we, um, well, we ended up with what we ended up with, I guess. Um, the other thing is we don't have any idea what the field management would be going on in that edge of field data set. So there, there are some complications there. Um, this is just throughout some results because everybody loves statistics and results. So um, we had 43,000 days that we could compare for all the edge of field data sets. And generally about 15% of the time we simulated a runoff event on all of those um, sites. The observation actually showed about 9%. So we're a little bit more than that's not unexpected. Uh, about 87% of the time we were correct. We either correct null or correct forecast. Um, and then um, when we were wrong, we were wrong 9% of the time were false alarms and 3% were misses. So we could dial that algorithm to be however we want. We could make sure we have zero misses, but we're going to have more false alarms or we could have less false alarms and maybe some misses. And then so the benefit is, or the, the, the give and take is, is if we miss, do we miss small events, not the largest events? And if we have false alarms, they're really small, we can threshold them out and not worry about them, not warn on them. So um, that's version two. So as mentioned, we have four states now, Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Ohio. And uh, Heather and Erica will be talking about their tools after this. Um, but the states take on the responsibility of taking the data we provide and putting it on their websites. They'll have a little different flavor, a little different way to interact with them. And, um, and so you can click on them and, and interrogate the, the data behind it a little bit more. And I'll go through that. 
Um, some additional considerations. So as I mentioned, risk is definitely stratified by the runoff magnitude. That's what we model. We don't model water quality. It's strictly water quantity. And as I mentioned, the, the largest events are where we have uh, confidence that the model is going to do well. We have a, lot, a higher probability of detection there. And that's also where we see that the edge of field data shows that's where a lot of the nutrients are lost. So if we, we definitely want to key in on those. Um, this tool is driven by weather forecasts. Weather forecasts obviously aren't perfect. Um, so if the model, the weather forecast is going to be off, this tool is going to be off. That's uh, this is something that has to be educated and, and uh, included in the outreach. Uh, we do have we have no way of incorporating what local land management might be going on. So if you apply liquid manure to your field, it might go from a low low or no risk day to a moderate or high risk. That's up to the farmer, the producer, to realize they've changed the conditions, and it's just because the tool says it's not a problem. Maybe they do have a problem. So it's it's definitely just this kind of goes back. This is just a tool that incorporates a lot of factors, but it's just another opportunity for farmers to kind of use in their day-to-day -day management decisions. It's never going to be a regulatory tool. There's too many limitations in the modeling. So where are we going now? So just this month we're starting off our third version. So we've already on our third different model for this and we're going to transfer over to the National Weather Service's new national water model. Um, that'll be run on an even finer scale resolution down to one kilometer at least. Um, it'll be multiple daily runs every day. Um, and it'll be available nationwide. So other states outside the Great Lakes where we've had great GLRI funding to help support this project, now this will be transitioning to almost a, a National Weather Service's um, uh, official product, essentially. And other states can come on board and, and team up with us. Um, yeah, so that'll be a two-year development process and probably a two-year uh, cycle to get it onto the operational supercomputer. So we're looking at four to five years out, probably. That, here's an example of the resolution for that um, model. So the, the very first one, version one, was that irregular shaped lump model. You can kind of see those weird basins, 300 square miles in Wisconsin. We have went down to the version two in the bottom there, that four kilometer by four kilometer. And now we'll be going up to the one kilometer grid. So um, we did do some social science evaluation with a group in the University of Wisconsin. And I won't read all this, but basically what we did, they did some focus groups and some surveys before and after presentations. And when people were instructed on what this tool does, how it works, they were a lot more positive and um, excited to use it and talk about it. They definitely made the point that weather is their number one factor that they have to take into consideration during applications. And so this tool is kind of incorporating not only just the weather, but also the soil conditions. <clears throat> and um, a kind of a big consensus was that the producers in the focus group, they want to do the best they can. They want to make the right decisions, and they're appreciative of tools that kind of help them go to that direction. And so finally, I feel like I've gone pretty fast here, but I don't, maybe I haven't. But um, our take on points, so again, this is a, a forecast guidance for producers to avoid applying more nutrients right before we pretty confident that they would be washed off the fields. Um, we're kind of promoting and expanding on that right time uh, message. Um, these are state-owned tools with weather service modeling, but they own the tools. Each state has a working group that kind of helps formulate and how, the, um, how the, the tool behaves and looks. And then we have a regional meeting where we all kind of have a consensus um, and talk about it. It's important for the states especially to, to um, communicate and um, set the expectations and, the, and communicate the limitations of this type of tool is not meant to just be the only thing you'd ever look at. Um, it's just another tool in the toolbox that maybe could help them um, avoid a, a bad situation. And I mentioned continuous improvement. We're already on version, we're working on version three, we've run through version one. Version two, we'll be doing another kind of update this summer. So this tool can be used to kind of advance the message of timing and, and, the, and the importance of it but um, the model isn't perfect. It's gonna continue to grow into the future. And the national water model is pretty brand new. It's gonna have some growing pains, but the advantage of it is that it's open to all academic, it's an open source type of model. So any kind of a, uh, collaboration with universities or the agencies can help improve it over time. And that is all I have. Time time, okay. All right, any questions? Are the 
state models calibrated independently or together? No, we, um, at, at the moment, so the model underlining is all just one model, and we just pick out clippings of it for each state. And when we did the kind of algorithm, we used edge of field data wherever we could across all the states and just kind of coalesced it together and took the average at this point. So the model so, parameters in Minnesota are the same? No, the model parameters change. Every, every grid cell has its own set of parameters, every four kilometer grid cell. Sure, but so like a parameter describing like a land use type or soil type, that would be the same in Wisconsin. Minnesota would have the same. Uh, the, the data set that they would come from yeah. would be the same, yeah. Okay. yeah. But the algorithm we use is the same everywhere. Yep. Yep. Where's your edge of field data coming So we've gotten edge of field data from the Discovery Farms in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Uh, the, U, the GLRI has funded the USGS to do some in New York, Indiana. I believe there's one uh, in Michigan. And then the USAARS has a, a lot of them in the Maumee. So we've teamed up with them as well in Ohio. The, the important thing about the edge of field monitoring is that we need year round, especially in the, in the north. We've run into some data sets where they don't monitor in the winter. As I mentioned, that you could be missing a lot of information. So we run the model twice every day. We run it um, around four to five in the morning, and then we run it again at um, about seven to eight in the morning. Um, we could, if the states were on it too, we could run it at an afternoon update and an evening update. We used to do a version one three times a day. Um, so it's just depending on the user need and the state's uh, desire to update the information. Go ahead. Yeah. The, uh, when I was looking at the model last summer, the last step in the process took me right back to weather.gov where they had the weather prediction for the day. Is that basically still there? Which state were you looking at? Ohio. Yeah, they, I think they did link to, back to the point and click kind of weather forecast. Um, that, that's just their prerogative to, to link to that. We provide them gridded data that, we prov that goes into the model. So all the forecast temperatures, precipitation, observed data, they can plot. Um, but sometimes they just find it easier to link to another source. It could be different, though, um, but because there's a lot of forecasts to choose from. Do any of the states who have these models have any kind of alert system that's a part of? Them? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good point. Because um, the the old way of doing things is a website, right, and having people come to your website, and it is hard. So. Michigan and, and Minnesota both have a text alert system and, and or email system. And I think that's, so the advantage is that somebody goes sign up for their individual cell, I'm, I'm stealing your thunder, and they would be alerted to that um, when that cell is at high risk or something like that. All right, any other questions? Any last questions? What's the, I mean, are you county based or? So right now it's about six square miles. It's a four kilometer by four kilometer grid. So they just, I walked in late, I'm sorry. Yeah. They just zoom into whatever spot. Do they put in a zip code or a county or how does that? That would be the, where the states, they handle the kind of the public usage of it. But yeah, basically you could search and, and I believe click on the actual cell and Erica can, and Heather can correct me. You can assign a name to it and then sign up for that alert. Heather, Minnesota might be different, I believe it's county based. So they were a lot of the custom uh, our focus group was mostly those. Um, we've presented at the, the professional nutrient application uh, work, uh, what do they call it Pino in Wisconsin and gotten their feedback. That's where the survey came from. Um, so as much as we can, they, um, their input is uh, taken into account. Yeah, because I would think you'd have a great impact if you have those people involved. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's up to the state working group. I don't lead, per se, the groups in individual states. It's up for them to kind of invite members in. Uh, I think Discovery Farms has usually been the kind of the, the farmer's perspective um, to this point. Um, but yeah, I think when we go out there and present it, 
Um, we've gotten a lot of feedback where even KFOs will use it and print it off, and I've seen some custom haulers will divert their their plans for the day or the week based on what would be going on. Let's thank our speaker.